Hi, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. And yeah, I was just getting started welcoming folks here to the center. Oh. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Hopefully, you are feeling very supple in your neck this afternoon for those who are going to be looking behind them. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to start with a bit of an explanation, which is really such a luxury for us to have with feeding your demons. Lama will walk through the phases and stages. Uh, of course, many of you are familiar with this practice in the room. How many people here have been feeding their demons before? Okay. And, and who are our newbies? Wonderful. So we'll do a, a walkthrough of the practice and, and then we'll describe the research study. And this research study, as many of you know, actually began in this center. It was a different location at the time, but it was a community-based participatory research study. So we'll show the highlight of the findings from that study. And then we'll have the amazing good fortune to be led in the Feeding Your Demons practice uh, by Lama Sultram Alioni and some time for question and answers. So that is... That is how we're going to proceed this afternoon. There's there's one more seat here that we had reserved and that person isn't coming. So somebody could sit there. There's two more people on the reserve list. So neither of them are yeah. coming. No. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Can we get started by settling in a little? What do you think? Yeah. Maybe raising bodhicitta, the intention to be together for the benefit of all beings. Heartfelt setting of intention. Thank you. And I'll take a moment here. Many of you um, know and love Lama Sultram Alioni already, but for those of you who don't, uh, Lama Sultram Alioni is an author. She's a scholar. She's a teacher. Uh, she founded the Tara Mandala Retreat Center in Colorado. How many people have been to Tara Mandala who are here? It's a very unique center, really upholding beautiful traditions and practices, as well as really infusing it with a um, kind of contemporary sense of community and connection that is possible. Uh, Lama's first book is Women of Wisdom, um, followed by Feeding Your Demons. And then more recently, it's the mandala, yes? The wisdom Rising. Wisdom Rising, which is the practice of, uh, of mandala. Is my mic working? Can everybody... Like here it's the the amplification should be actually for online as opposed to in the room yeah so this doesn't need to be on it's it's on so that it, the recording okay. is well um can you all hear me in the back yeah okay okay um and yeah we'll we'll go ahead and, and get started here so the first slides, if you would like to look at them in the back. There we go. Yeah. That's the, some sort of blessing to come in. Um, so the origins of feeding your demon um, is based on the Tibetan practice of Chud, uh, originated by the 11th century Tibetan yogi, Machik Labdra. Yogini. Yogini. <laughs> Um, and yeah, the demons represent inner fears and distortions, and the process is one of emotional alchemy. And then, Lama, I'll let you talk a bit more about the origins themselves of mm. how you brought this practice together. Yeah. So I met this practice of Chud in 1971 in India 
it was a time when I I had been a nun for four years and I was about to disrobe. And one day I was with my teacher. His name was Abba Rinpoche. He was a, a mountain yogi. And one of the Tibetan road workers, they, they employed Tibetan refugees repairing Indian roads when they escaped from Tibet. So one of them came in the afternoon and he was ill. And so Rinpoche had said to him, come back tonight. And then he said to me, you come back too. And so I had, I went back that night and entered their house and I heard the drum going and went up the stairs and went into the shrine room where normally people are sort of sitting behind bench like tables uh, in rows. And that night they were in a circle and this man was lying down in the middle of that circle. And they had drums and bells and they were singing. And I didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> and so I just meditated and watched and felt like this was a song I had heard before somehow, you know, that feeling I've heard this before. And then went home that night up to my retreat cabin and then went the next day to Avarumbache and said, what was that? And he said, that was Chut from Achiklaptran. And I said, can I learn it? And he said, yes, because I had completed my preliminary practices. So I learned it at that time. And it was right around the same time that I got pregnant with my first child. I had disrobed. And I was so I was pregnant, <laughs> returning from India after living there for a while. And so it was a huge time of transition for me. And I, I learned this practice. But I didn't really understand it. Until quite a bit later, I had my daughter and then I had another <laughs> one. And then eventually I moved to Italy and I met a Chugyal. Namke Norbu Rinpoche. Did any of you meet him? His this life. So he um, he was a great Dzogchen master, and he had dreamt a should practice and then written it down. And so when I met him, I learned that. And so that was uh, 1979, 80, and. So eventually around 1984, he asked me to start teaching that practice. And so when I did, I realized that this idea that's in the actual traditional practice of, of feeding the demons, and not only the demons, but you feed the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and so on, various different guests, but that this was a very conceptual idea for the people that I was teaching. And so I thought, how can I make this more real, more kind of personal and relatable to these Westerners who are singing in Tibetan, ringing a bell and, and, and trying to do a drum and visualize something at the same time. And so I invented this method, this five-step method of feeding your demons as a teaching tool really for this Tibetan practice. And at the time I had a lot of students still do who are psychotherapists. And they said to me, you know, that exercise of feeding your demons, I've been using it with my clients. <laughs> and they're telling me that that's all their clients want. They, they don't want the regular therapy anymore. They just come in and say, can we do the demon work? And so that's when I realized it, it really had a life of its own. And, and then I began to teach it as a separate thing eventually, and then wrote the book in 2008 of Feeding Your Demons. So it really evolved as a teaching technique, really. 
um, and then took on a life of its own, mm-hmm. as you will see. <laughs> and uh, you were so kind to share some of these photos of the practices that um, you did um, on your tour. I, I wonder if you mm-hmm. can tell us a bit about these photos and, you know, the traditional practice and going to these yeah. uh, haunted lands or difficult places. Yeah, it's called Nyansa Pilgrimage. I did this in 2012 um, and Nyansa means difficult places. And so you go to places that scare you literally. So I went to uh, over 40 different charnel grounds and caves in India and Sikkim and Nepal and did this practice often staying alone at night in these places where you actually do get scared. And I succeeded in getting scared, <laughs> which is the idea because you, as the fear arises, you offer your body. So when you get that feeling of wanting to protect it, you offer it instead. And that's a traditional part of training in this practice to go to places that scare you literally. And so there's two of those that are the same cave in uh, Sikkim. It's called the the Khandro Sangpuk, the two on the right. Uh, It's different angles on the outside of that cave. But actually the part that I stayed in overnight alone was uh, you had to crawl into it. And it was like about a five minute crawl. And then when I got in there, it was hot because there were hot springs around there. So there was some sort of uh, heat coming in. And there's a a lot of earthquakes in Sikkim. And so it was very claustrophobic. And, uh, And then as, as, the sun set outside, bats started going like zooming by me. And then rats started coming around my legs. And so I stayed there all night in that heat and claustrophobia and uh, kind of revulsion from these rats and bats and everything else that was there. Um, but the outside was really nice, as you can see. <laughs> But that was a that was a really interesting night because in the middle of the night, I was like, I I don't think I can do this anymore. I think I need to go out. It's so claustrophobic. I'm so scared there's going to be an earthquake and I'm going to be stuck in here. And and then right at that moment, it's like the, the, the it was like the most extreme pressure from the situation. Right in that moment, I thought. Well, actually, it's all empty. Mm. All this is empty. And I I had experience really by being pushed so hard into the fear that when I broke through into that experience, it was that liberating. It was as liberating as it had been claustrophobic. Mm. And that was a moment when I recognized this is the reason you have to do this. Because when you're pushed to the fear to that extent, Mm. then the liberation is that much stronger. Mm. So that was there. And then the other one is in Tibet. Um, That was uh, taken in a sacred place in Tibet. After my husband died in 2010, I went uh, to Tibet to Machi Klopton's cave and also to some other sacred places. And that was taken in one of those caves. Mm, Beautiful. We have this quote here. Would you like me to read that for us? Yeah, I have right in front. So it's easy. Accepting willingly what is undesirable, throwing oneself defiantly into unpleasant circumstances, realizing that gods and demons are one's own mind and ruthlessly severing self-centered arrogance through an understanding of the sameness of self and others. Yeah. 
So that's what I was talking about. <laughs> it's, a, it's really, um, it's really an interesting practice because you do the opposite of what you would intuitively do. You, you know what I mean? Like you intuitively would not go to place, places that scare you. You would not offer your body in those places. But because you're going against that natural tendency, you're breaking through conditioning at a very deep level. And it's very liberating. Mm -hmm. I had another experience uh, in Sikkim. I was I was staying in a, another tunnel ground, a uh, place where bodies are burned. And I decided to stay there for three days and three nights. And uh, right after I made that decision, I did the practice. Should, and I had my eyes closed, this singing and visualizing. And then like about, I don't know, halfway through the practice, I decided to open my eyes and there standing there was this guy uh, looking at me very menacingly with a, a machete in his belt. And he looked like, like he had plans. <laughs> and I was, I was like, Oh my God, he's seen my, you know, my, uh, I have my gold earrings and he's like seeing the earrings and he's like, he's going to like kill me and then take all my stuff. And, uh, and it really looked like he, 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 he was going to do something. And, um, and then I thought, well, you're, you're on the Nyensa pilgrimage. This is the moment to face the fear. And I closed my eyes again. And uh, and just and just kept going, and I, at any moment I thought maybe I was going to like feel the knife on my neck, and so that was again this like there, there's a word that's used during this pilgrimage which is dulshuk, which means to uh, it's like to push through. Mm -hmm. uh, it's usually it's usually uh, translated as vanquishing conduct, and I never really knew what that meant until I did this pilgrimage. And then I realized that that's what it is. It's like meeting something and then pushing through it. And so you might think like, well, what does this have to do with my life uh, for all of you? Like, but in a way we meet these kind of things in our lives that maybe not a cave in the Himalayas, but maybe it's a diagnosis of an illness that you didn't expect or something happens to somebody in your life or you end up in a weird situation or you, or you can also do this in this country like in there's so much wilderness and you know places you can go to do this practice but in any case it's when you're put into discomfort and there's a natural tendency to want to get away and instead you push through that and you stay and you let go. Mm -hmm. You let go of your body. And, and that's very powerful. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not recommending you put yourself in danger. Um, and they say that too, like don't actually be in danger, like kind of try to go to the edge, but not actually be in danger. And uh so anyway, that's uh, that's part of the tradition. It's, it's actually an essential part to do this pilgrimage called the Nyansa pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. My son did it also. He did it. He walked from Ladakh, which is way in northwest India. He walked for four months. He did it. And he walked down into India uh, over the Himalayas and uh, had several near-death experiences and really amazing story of, of his travels. And he went to 108 different cemeteries and, and did the practice. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you must be balancing your pride with your fear for him at that time. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Well, we didn't hear from him. I mean, it was just like, I, you know, and then it was, he always had this thing when he was younger, like, don't tell mom. <laughs> and uh, he would, he would tell um, my husband, Dave, but 
don't tell mom. So it was a don't tell mom until it was over. And then he told me. So I was like, oh, God. <laughs> and uh, before we move on to walking through the steps, you know, there's one part of this quote, and I heard you speak about this yesterday. Um, that that pushing through that moment where you invite in and you get to the next phase, um, what's discovered <clears throat> is this, what it says here is like the sameness of self and others, or, you know, this sense of truly kind of non-separateness. That, that's a little surprising. And I'm just curious if you can just say a little bit more about that part. And, and as we do the practice, I don't want to spoil it Here for people. It's really based on the on the self, right? You're not afraid, and this is some, someone to protect or something to protect. And so when you break through that protection of self, which really actually we're doing that all the time with our ego, we're protecting ourself, you know? We want to uh, look good. We, we want to be acceptable. We want you know, we, we're protecting ourselves. And when you, when you push through that, break through that, there's a natural experience of non-duality. Mm -hmm. Because if there's no self, there's no other. But the thing about this pilgrimage that was so powerful for me was because it was real fear. When the, when the breakthrough happened, that was equally intense. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I couldn't have experienced without doing that, without actually doing it. Thank you. Beautiful. So we have a little bit of the description of the, the five steps here that I thought would be nice for folks to see um, and have you describe a bit for us. Yeah, so this is the five steps of feeding your demons. And in the first step, you find it in your body. So when I say demons, I mean uh, like depression or anxiety or an addiction or a fear. Uh, if it's something to do with relationships, you work with the feeling that comes up for you in the relationship. So. In the first step, I'll have you close your eyes and then you'll think about whatever it is you decided to work with. Let's say it's a fear. And I'll say, recall perhaps the situation when this came up very strongly for you, or maybe it's up right now. And then I'll say, notice where in your body you hold that. Where do you hold that feeling most strongly in your body? And then I'll say, if it were to have a color, what color would it be in your body? If it were to have a shape, what would that be? If it had a consistency, what, that would, what would that be? And if it had a temperature, what would that be? And so that's the first step. <clears throat> and then in the second step, you personify that shape, that color, that energy that's in your body, you imagine that it moves out of your body and is personified as a being in front of you. And you notice all the details about that being. Uh, then you ask three questions uh, to the demon. I can't actually see the slides, so yeah. um, <laughs> uh, the three questions are, what do you want? Which is, what's the thing that is most obvious that the demon is trying to get you to do? Uh, let's say it's a fear of flying, for example. It's trying to get you not to fly. That's what it wants. And then what do you really need? That's what's under that. So let's say it's that fear of flying. It wants to be safe. I need to feel safe. And then how will you feel if you get what you really need is the third question. And then it 
it might be, I feel safe. I feel, yeah, at ease. So you, you, you as you see the demon in front of you and it has arms and legs and face and so on. And you ask those three questions and then you change places. So what I'm going to do here is have you stand up and face where you're sitting now. And then you'll become the demon. And so once you become the demon, then you answer those three questions. I feel um, what I want is what I really need is. And if I get what I really need, I was, I will feel once you've done that, then you come back into your original position and then you dissolve your body. You imagine that your body dissolves into nectar. And that nectar then has the quality of the feeling the demon will have when it gets what it really needs. And that's what you feed the demon. And you feed it to complete satisfaction. And once it's completely satisfied, then you meet the ally. So the ally is what the demon transforms into. Once you've finished and it's completely satisfied, there's a being that remains or it's disappeared completely. If there's a being that remains, you ask it, are you the ally? And it may be and it may not be. If it says yes, you'll work with that. If it says no, then you will um, invite the ally to appear. And you do that also if it's disappeared completely. So that's uh, that's that wonderful step. Meet the ally. And then you ask the ally, <laughs> how will you help me? How will you protect me? What is your promise to me? And how can I access you for questions? And don't worry, I'll guide you through all this. You don't have to remember any, any of what I'm saying right now. We're just taking you through the process. So you ask those questions of the ally, and then you become the ally. And then the ally answers those four questions. And then you come back into your original seat, seeing the ally in front of you. and. Um, and then you absorb the ally into yourself and then you and the ally dissolve and you rest in open awareness. And that's the fifth step. Hmm. Fifth step. The fifth step is back to this visualization. Oh, Very, you don't have the fifth step? Mm -mm, just as that image at the okay. bottom. Yeah. Yeah. So then uh, I think we'll shift into a little description of the study yeah, and then go into the practice together. So for folks, um, as I mentioned, we started the study here at the what was then against the stream and became the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And just in order to kind of bring it full circle, I, I really do want to like welcome everyone here to what is now the Dharma Collective and this space. And um, this is an entirely volunteer run center. So there is no guiding or leading teacher who's running it. It's run by a board and volunteers, many of whom are here today. And we just feel really fortunate to have a center where we get to be connected in this way with teachings, with amazing teachers like Lama Sultram and also other teachers here offering Dharma and having a research study based in a community setting was quite unique for us. That's not something uh, the Dharma Center ever set out to do was be a research hub. And it was a really interesting process for us. Um, I want to share a bit of the highlights from the study itself. 
So the first thing is really to share um, that we were so fortunate that actually the two papers from the study were, the first two papers from the study were both published this fall, one in the Journal of Emotion and Psychopathology, and that's a randomized control trial of Tibetan Buddhist feeding your demons, contemplative process in meditation practitioners is the title. Both of these are freely available online. Some um, academic articles, unfortunately, are behind a paywall, but these are open access. And the other article is in Frontiers in Psychology. And the title of that is Transforming Adversity into Ally, a Qualitative Study of Feeding Your Demons Meditation. I have my incredible research colleagues here um, in photograph. We have Philippe Goldin. He was the principal investigator. and. He's just such a so passionate about this research and so passionate about expanding the field of meditation and mindfulness beyond focused attention and open monitoring, which are the primary practices which are studied. To really bring in a practice that is based in Vajrayana Buddhism is quite unique. Uh, in our literature review, we only found five other peer review published studies that we could cite. So to bring in a different uh, orientation and format, we know that the psychology of well-being is well bolstered with meditation studies, but the view of which meditation is still quite narrow. It was, for this reason, pretty hard to get our papers published. It took us quite a while. Um, when you do something new, you have to really doubly prove yourself. But being part of this amazing team, it was really a community. Uh, and we really supported each other in kind of getting all the revisions in and really staying close. So it wasn't just a professional connection between us. It really was our love of the Dharma and our love of research and how to get new ideas out there. There was also Jennifer Daubenmeyer there, who's a professor at San Francisco State University and um, also a you know, really committed practitioner studying Vajrayana and women. Um, there's CJ Koenig there, um, also at SF State. He and I worked very closely to together on the qualitative research study. He's done a lot of research looking at how do we make the stories or the narrative experience of participants data. Uh, I love qualitative research for that reason. It really lifts up the voices of your participants that are not merely the numbers of, you know, how many points above or below this line did they fall so we can say they're depressed or not. It's how they articulate their experience. We thought this was especially important for a study that was the first of its kind. So not just maybe you can. I mean, I don't know if everybody knows quantitative, qualitative. Yeah. And also what they did, uh, you know, the yeah. journals and so on. Yeah, yeah. I'll get into it a bit more, mm -hmm. too, um, in, in each of these. But I think, um, you know, suffice to say that in the quantitative, we're really looking at the surveys. We're looking at depression, anxiety, compassion, and how people improve or not improve over the course of the time that they're doing Feeding Your Demons. I'll talk about the study design in a moment, but it was pretty elaborate in that people did the practice over the course of a month every other day. So they did 15 practices in total. Um, it's quite usual for us to have a really high dropout rate in such studies. We're asking a lot of people. We only had one person drop out in the entire study. So we started recruiting recruitment and we had to close it 48 hours later because we were already way overfilled with how many people wanted to be involved. This is, again, the beauty of a, a community-based research study, not one where just kind of flyering in a random hospital or clinic, but where we really brought together practitioners and who were interested in learning. Um, so then we have here also uh, Kate Greer Dixon, who is a student of Lama Sultram and also doing um, her research study in kind of union analysis, also looking at feeding your demons. We have Lopan Chandra Easton, uh, who participated in the quantitative study and was is a teacher here and was teaching at that time feeding your demons here quite often. Um, Vanessa Simons and Amy Braun were our amazing research assistants. They helped. So we're in our charnel ground here, uh, unfortunately. Um, we had them helping organize all the participants who were involved and responding to emails. And then we were really intentional. Many of you in your hand right now have the Feeding Your Demons um, journal or one page. But we created, you know, a booklet for everyone. And we didn't want people to write about their feeding your demons on a screen. 
we felt like that really undermined the intimacy of writing in a journal. But that also meant that we then had to transcribe everybody's journal word by word. So there was just a lot of um, effort and intention that went into it. Um, oh, there, there's rest and awareness. Got lost in the mix. <laughs> it's always good. Yeah. <laughs> So in our study, you know, just to give you a bit of the details, again, you can look up the study on your own so that you can get a better sense of all the details if you want to dig into it deeply. But we enrolled 107 participants um, in total because you often enroll more people than you want. We wanted 60 people. So we were really um you know, interested in having people who already were working with some kind of craving, some kind of addiction um, against the stream and the Dharma Collective. Also, we support refuge recovery. We support people who are working in the Dharma in order to maintain sobriety. So we had a lot of our participants working with craving of substance, but so many kinds of craving, uh, as we often talk about here at the Dharma Collective. So having people really focus and work with that area. Um, we then randomized half of the group to be our active group, meaning for 30 days, they were doing the practice every other day and the other group waited. So they became our, what we call control group. So for 30 days, we have one group of people doing feeding your demons every other day. And for one month, the other group is just doing what they normally do, meditating. And at the end of the 30, the second group started doing their practice. In this kind of design, what we're able to do is really compare a group of active practitioners with a group of people not actively doing that same practice. So instead of just comparing them from the beginning to the end, it's a much more rigorous way for us to understand change over time. That's your 101 RCT. Um, and after we did this, you know, everyone, as they were doing it, were as we were doing the um, Feeding Your Demons practice, they were really fortunate in that we had um, an opportunity for them to work one-on-one -on -one, um, with a teacher. So there was a number of teachers involved who were trained in Feeding Your Demons who would sit with our participants. They had recordings from Lama and from Lopan Chandra Easton as well. And they were filling out this journal. After they completed their 30 days, everyone took these surveys so that we could compare them at the beginning and the end. And I'll talk more about those. But it was uh, really interesting to kind of follow these people over time and really kind of keep up and pay attention to the impact of what people were experiencing, both through their journals and through their surveys. So we um, have our basic participant population demographics here. Um, it was in our um, overall, we had 24 females and in our one group and 19 in the other. So we in our two groups, there was not a big difference in terms of gender. Um, it was interesting for us doing a research study with already people who are already practitioners, many research studies of meditation, people have never meditated, but many of our practitioners had been meditating for a number of years and had a regular practice. Um, our average age was around 42 years old. Um, and we really tried to make sure that our treatment group and our waitlist group were the same so we could make sure that we could compare them well. We looked at depression and anxiety and stress. We looked at intolerance for uncertainty, satisfaction with life, emotion regulation, self-compassion, and an embodied emotion awareness scale. So this was our self-report surveys that we had at these two times for each of these groups. And for the qualitative, um, you know, we had just, we still have just so much incredible data. Everybody wrote about the texture of their demon, the shape of their demon, the color of their demon. They wrote about, you know, what it, they really needed, what they really wanted. So we had all this rich data. And as we looked at it, we thought, what's the most kind of important salient piece for us? And we added questions at the end of the journal that were new for a Feeding Your Demons practice. And those questions were at the very end, after you'd filled in about your demon feeding experience, how do you make sense of your experience? What was new or familiar? What, if anything, do you want to carry forward? So those are questions that we consider to be meaning-making questions. So the first questions are really phenomenal or phenomenological questions. This is what it was. This is what it wasn't. 
but then this, well, you know, how do you make sense of it? And what do you want to carry forward? That is what we analyzed. That gave us the big greatest insight into the overarching impact of this practice. So for us, um, it was pretty, I'm going to just talk through this slide a little. For us, it was really interesting that we had to um, align the feeding, each step of feeding your demons with a different type of meditation practice. So in step one, you know, you're really doing something that could be called in the meditation literature, like body scan. You're noticing sensations in your body, your mindfulness of the body sensations and your thoughts and feelings. It's considered in the attentional family of meditation practices. I won't go through each phase, but suffice to say it was important for us and for this first journal that we were able to show that each phase of feeding your demons employs different types of meditation. So it's not just one practice in terms of the current scientific literature, feeding your demons fulfills attention style practices, constructive practices. It includes guided imagery. It includes um, compassion and, you know, a kind of openness. And it's, it's quite interesting to look at all the different aspects of meditation in the current research that's included in just one feeding your demons practice. And the, what might happen for people during that practice includes interoception or an embodied awareness, meta awareness, being aware of your thoughts and feelings that are happening, and also a real self inquiry or reappraisal. What's going on for me? So many meditations, especially simple meditations, we're kind of focusing in one area and trying to push everything out, just, just focusing on my breath, or just focusing on sensations in my body. But this inquiry mode of practice is quite important and unique, and it gives us a sense of developing our own awareness of our experience. I want to share a little bit of the kind of entries of what people wrote. Um, it was so interesting for us. I'll, I'll read these out loud. So when we did the qualitative research, we read through every single diary. Uh, we looked for themes. What were the themes that were coming up? Not over just one person, but many people. So imagine reading, you know, we had 60 participants and they had journal entries at minimum 11 times. So after we read all of those journal entries for the first time, we thought, what's really coming up? What are people describing many times? One of our big codes was empathy for the demon. And this participant, which is participant number 4061, you know, we don't have anything identifying. And under empathy for the demon, this is one example I'd connected with my inner child once or twice before and discovered some themes, but I don't think I'd appreciated or examined the frightening, screeching, loud depths of it before. We never really talked like that, and I'd never admitted before to myself or anyone else a truth I felt guilty for. She's right. I've hid her and acted as though I hate her. So that's a way of really bringing forth this material and, you know, finding this empathy for this part of ourselves that's been neglected. Another theme for us that was interesting was one of fierce compassion. So there's quite a lot in the compassion training literature on this kind of sense of care and kindness with compassion. But we were really interested to see that many people describe not only a sense of that care and kindness towards their demon, but also like enough right? Like, no more. I'm not going to do this any longer. So this is um, one example of this fierce compassion energy that we read in a lot of the participant entries. So this is participant 4052. And they said, I haven't relayed my anger to the person I'm feeling it at because she extreme, she's extremely delusional. I'm holding it in huge fists of fury of the demon. What I didn't see is how hurt I am by her actions and how much I need to set boundaries of compassion for myself. This relationship is for finding true wisdom in common. The wisdom is internal. So just really beautiful ways that people are taking what they've reflected on in their demons and really finding this inner wisdom, setting boundaries, right? That kind of fierce compassion. We also have the real nurturing, kind compassion that came up quite a lot in this example. 
that I can generate those feelings of love and belonging for myself. I can now know that I had these experiences at an infant, but that I can repair them and that I can access these positive emotions by looking into my heart to draw forth my love and strength. So it's just reading all of these was so beautiful for us. It was such a, an honor to read everybody's um, journals and that they were so willing to share with us. It was incredible. Um, so we had these themes that came up around the meaning making, how people understand. So developing empathy for the, for the demon, also really kind of reconnecting and finding confidence and worthiness, feeling empathy, self-awareness um, and responsibility. There's also a sense of, you know, the action they want to take. So how do you make meaning of it? What action do you want to take? In the action, it was this cultivating of fierce compassion, cultivating of nurturing compassion, and a real reframing or deeper understanding of their experience. Many people described a real trust in the feeding your demons process. So what they wanted to take forward or into action was, I trust in this process. Um, and there was a beautiful smaller amount of people describing experiencing what we could only um, label as the numinous. It was kind of these beautiful experiences of the ineffable. <laughs> I also wanted to share a little bit of our quantitative highlights. So when we look at the kind of percentage increase or change for people, uh, I just am highlighting a couple here that are meaningful. Um, we did find that overall people decreased their experienced uh, depression to their self-report by 33.6%. It increased their satisfaction with life on a group whole of 28%. It increased their self-compassion by 29%. So I think it's really meaningful to see that this sense of um, this practice can really help people, not only in their understanding and wisdom of themselves as we read through their uh, excerpts, but also really help them at this quantitative level of improving their psychological health and well-being. I do want to say, of course, that um, the practice can be evocative and emotional. Uh, we did have one participant who struggled in their feeding their demons practice. They needed more support than they could get um, just by doing this practice. They probably needed more psychological support. So in, in that time when we were um, working with our participants, we were really careful and cautious. And this one person was the person who did leave the study. And we thought that was a good idea for them at the time and really important to recognize one's own limits. And yeah, just to kind of um, sum it up, we had an amazing study team um, that was from a variety of different universities including our research assistants and Paramandala was a very generous funder making this possible for us to do the study and have everybody here included. So just really a, a delight to be able to share some of these findings with you all after um, the years of working with it, collecting the data and analyzing the data. And we hope there are many studies to come. Uh, it's obviously very promising what we found so far. And with that, I can stop, we can stop looking at the screen, which is so wonderful. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> All the people in my <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Eve. Um, this is the first study that's been done on on feeding your demons, and so I have a question, which is those those uh, statistics that you gave at the end of thirty three percent less depression. Was it twenty seven and twenty three? The other ones, the compassion. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how does that compare to say mindfulness practice? Ooh, gosh, I would have to like, come, I would have to look directly at certain studies. What's interesting with, um, with my like MBSR mindfulness-based stress reduction is 
we don't quite know what works about those studies because it's a training in which you have a group of people and, you know, a number of different practices, readings, you know, other things together. So I think it's um, it's sometimes even hard for us to know what's working about it. Um, is it just doing, you know, mindfulness of breathing or is it the kind of Qigong that's brought in? So I'll just uh -huh. say that as a caveat. And the improvements in well-being um, in those studies with depression, anxiety, they I can't say they exactly match, but they've definitely been encouraging enough to keep these studies going over these many years. <laughs> um, so I would say just offhand, at least as good, um, the feeding your demons, if not better. And the self-compassion, I think uniquely so, you wouldn't necessarily get self-compassion from a general everyday mindfulness study mm -hmm. unless there was explicit focus on it. Mm -hmm. Though there are many um, compassion-based trainings which that might be more of a focus. Mm -hmm. Was anybody that's here today in the study? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Yeah. Ah, so, uh, shall we do it? Let's do it. Yeah. Let's just have a moment to stand up and stretch for a minute because I've been sitting for a while. Ah, oh, so let's breathe in, put your hands up in the air, inhale and exhale. Mm -hmm. And again, up. Try to touch the ceiling. Ah. And exhale. It's so good <laughs> to move. Inhale. <laughs> Stretch it. Ah. And then keep one arm up and slide the other one down your thigh. Feel that stretch on your side. Ah, I'm really doing this because I want to do it. <laughs> stretch down. And then put your hands on your waist and, and roll. Oh, and let your head really roll to it. Ah. And breathe. And then go the other way. Breathe in as you go back and out as you go forward. And then put your shoulders up and make them really tight. And then let them go and make them tight. Again. The better? <laughs> yes, okay. So we're going to do feeding your demons and um, I will uh, lead you in it. Uh, during the process, you're going to become the demon. And when you do that, you will stand up and face where you're sitting now. So just be sure you have enough room wherever you're sitting to do that. Um, if you're on the floor, you can just uh, sit and face where you're sitting now. And the same will happen uh, when we become the ally. So there's nothing else really that you need to do to prepare. I think the difference between the want and the need is clear, is, is it? Those two questions? Yeah. Do you have any questions before we begin? Maybe what should I work with? Or <laughs> What I suggest is work with something that's actually up for you, that's real. Like, is there something that's bothering you? Is there something that um, is sort of draining your energy right now in your life? Maybe you have a financial concern. 
Maybe you have uh, a, a illness concern. Maybe you have a fear or you have depression or something that's actually real for you that you is bothering you. A, a simple way to decide is what is taking my energy? What's draining me? And then work with that. Is that clear? So let, let me just give you a moment to think about what you want to do, work with today. So I'll just, we'll have a moment of silence. You can close your eyes and, and just feel what, what, what's up for me right now. What do I want to work with? Okay. Do you have something? Do you have a lot, uh, like a long list? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so if you do, then uh, just choose something. You don't have to feel like this has to be the ultimate demon because you can do this again. And uh, so... I'll guide you in everything. You, you won't need to take notes or look at anything. And so let's begin with some relaxation breathing. And um, all of you online, um, can you all hear? Okay. Thumbs up. Okay, good. And uh, so nice to be with you also. So let's close our eyes and... Notice any physical tension that you're holding in your body. And breathe into that physical tension. Imagine the breath goes to it, hooks it, and then you release that with the exhalation. <clears throat> Physical tension, breathe into it and let it go with the out breaths. Then notice any emotional tension that you're holding. Notice where in your body you're holding emotional tension. Breathe into that. Imagine the breath hooks it and it rides out on the exhalation. And then notice any mental tension that you're holding that might be thoughts or worries that you're holding mentally. Notice where that mental tension is in your body. Inhale. Take the breath there and then release it with the out breath. Mental tension. And now take a moment to generate 
your motivation for the practice, a heartfelt motivation to do it for the benefit of yourself and all beings. All beings as vast as space. And a heartfelt intention. May I do this for the benefit of all beings. And now, recalling the demon that you decided to work with today, perhaps thinking of an incident when this came up strongly for you, thinking about it, notice where in your body you hold this most strongly. When you think about it, scan your body and feel where you're holding the energy connected to this particular demon most strongly and bring your attention to that place in your body. If this were to have a shape in your body, what shape would it take? And if it were to have a color, what color would it be? What's its texture or consistency like? And what's its temperature? Now intensify this energy in your body, bringing your full attention to this place in your body with its shape, its color, its consistency, and its temperature. And now, Imagine that that shape with its energy, its consistency, its temperature, and its color, that, that whole mass moves out of your body. And if it's helpful, you can make a gesture of actually taking it out. It moves out of your body and it becomes personified as a being in front of you facing you and that being has arms and legs and a face and so on. So take a moment and allow it to take shape. If for some reason you can't see it, imagine what it would look like if you could see it and work with that. And you can do that anywhere along the line. Just imagine if you could see it, what would it be?
So now notice the size of this being. How big is it? What color is it? What's the density of its body? How dense is it? Does it have a gender? Notice its color, inside and out. And what's the surface of its skin or whatever's covering its body, what's, what's that like? And what's the look in its eyes? When you look into its eyes, what do you see? What's its emotional state right now? What's its emotional state? And what kind of character does it have in general? What's its character like? And now notice something about it that you didn't see before. Notice something that you hadn't noticed before. And now we're going to ask it three questions. I'll give them to you one at a time and then silently address those questions to the demon that you're seeing in front of you. What do you want? What do you really need? What do you really need? How will you feel if you get what you really need? And now get up, change places facing where you're sitting now. And come into the body of the demon. Take a moment coming into the body of the demon. And nod your head when you're in the body of the demon. Nod your head when you feel you're there. You can see it in front of you. And becoming the demon, seeing your normal self in front of you. 
then we'll answer those questions. First, notice how your normal self looks from the demon's point of view. As the demon, you're looking at your normal self and see how your normal self looks. Mm -hmm. And now we'll answer those questions as the demon. I'll give you the beginning of each answer, repeat it, and then finish the response. What I want is... <laughs> What I want is <clears throat> what I really need is what I really need is. If I get what I really need, I will feel. If I get what I really need, I will feel. And remembering the answer to the third question, if I get what I really need, I will feel. Come back and sit in your original seat. Take a moment to come back into your own body. See the demon in front of you again and nod when you are back in your body. Now seeing the demon in front, imagine that your own body dissolves. Your own body dissolves into nectar and that nectar has a color and the quality of that nectar is the answer to the third question. Your body dissolves into a colored nectar and its quality is the answer to the third question. How the demon will feel if it gets what it really needs. Then that nectar begins to flow toward the demon. And the demon is nurtured by it. it takes it in. Notice how it takes it in. Is it drinking it? Is it coming in through the top of its head and entering its body? Or how is it going in? The demon is taking it in, this infinite quantity of nectar. And you're feeding the demon that nectar that has that quality.
as the demon takes it in, notice how the demon receives it and what's happening to the demon as it's being nurtured. being fed to complete satisfaction, infinite quantity. Gradually, it's becoming completely satisfied. As it becomes completely satisfied, notice what happens. What does it look like? Or does it disappear? Becoming completely satisfied. And now it is completely satisfied. Notice what remains, if anything. If there's a being that remains, ask that being, are you the ally? Are you the ally? And listen to its response. If it is the ally, you work with that. If it's not the ally, or if the demon has completely disappeared, invite the ally to appear. Invite the ally to appear. And if perhaps an inanimate object appears as the ally, invite that inanimate object to become a being. A being. Now notice what the size of the ally is, how big is it? Does the ally have a gender? It may or it may not. What's the color of the ally, or what color is the ally wearing? It's wearing something. What's the density of the ally's body? What's the surface of its skin or whatever's covering its body? What's that like? What 
what's the look in the ally's eyes? What's the emotional state of the ally? What's the character of the ally like? What kind of character does it have? And now notice something about the ally that you didn't see before. Something you didn't notice that now you notice. And now we'll ask the allies some questions. I'll give them to you one at a time. And then you silently ask those. How will you help me? How will you protect me? What is your pledge to me? How can I access you? And now keeping your eyes closed as much as possible, stand up and face where you're sitting now. Take a moment to come into the body of the ally, and if it's helpful, you can make a gesture or take the posture of the ally. And then notice how your normal self looks from the ally's point of view. And now the ally will answer those questions. I'll give you the beginning of each answer. Repeat that and then finish it. I will help you by... I will help you by... I will protect you by I will protect you by My pledge to you is You can access me by You can access me by And now, keeping your eyes closed as much as possible, come back into your seat and see the ally in front of you. And nod when you're back and you're really back in your own body and seeing the ally in front of you. Now, 
Notice the eyes of the ally and feel the support from your ally. Feel that beneficent energy of the ally coming into your body through the eyes of the ally, but also through the whole body of the ally. It's sending you its support, protection, has pledged to you. And let yourself feel that in your body. Notice how that feels in your body. And now the ally dissolves into light. Notice the color of the light that the ally dissolves into. And then that light dissolves into you. The light of the ally dissolves into you. That color, the color of that luminosity spreads through your whole body. And it's as though it's washing all of your cells with light, with that color. It's going all the way down to your toes. through the whole trunk of your body and your arms all the way down to your fingertips. Up your neck and head. Bathed with light. And that light has the quality of the ally. Notice how that feels. And then your own body. With the integrated energy of the ally also dissolves. Your whole body dissolves and rests in what's ever present after the disillusion. It dissolves and then just rest. Oh. Just rest. And then come back into your body with the energy of the ally present. And again, recall 
what that feels like to have the energy of the ally in your body. Recall it in a way you will be able to remember it later. And then gradually open your eyes, keeping the sensation of the ally in your body as you open your eyes. And then look around a little bit. And as you do, keep the energy of the ally present in your body. And we'll dedicate the merit of the practice. Any positive energy we've accumulated may it benefit all beings. Thank you. I think it might be nice to um, share a little bit with each other um, your experience before we have questions. So um, what I would suggest is you turn to somebody next to you and, and of course, if both people on either side turn to somebody else, yes. <laughs> you might develop a team of <laughs> feeling rejected. But uh, find, turn around, try to find someone. And you don't have to tell them what you were working with, if that's an intimate um, thing that you, you don't need to share that. But just, uh, we'll just take a few minutes and just share what, what, your experience was and if you have any questions or something came up that didn't work for you then you can share that and then we'll come back into the bigger group and um i'll ring a bell in a few minutes so find someone and then i'll time um two minutes for each person and ring a bell in between and then the other person will start talking okay all right. Maybe our friends online can do it by chat with one another. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if uh, I don't know if they could be put into little rooms. And then if you, if you don't find a, a partner, then raise your hand and stand up uh, so that you. you you can find someone. Uh, stand up if you don't have a partner. Here's somebody without a partner. Okay. Time, two minutes. Good. I was working with rumination. Very powerful. It made me. I never really experienced it around feeling like regret, like not being able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever done a video game in two days in a row? It's. I like really. I'm like, wow. I should do this every day this week. Like it's very like to do it. You know, like it's very different. So do it more regularly. Yeah. It's your yeah, 
really noticed that it felt much crisper in the process. And I, yeah, yeah, it's like I find that it's ways of finding the same thing. Yeah. It's, it's such a different color or shape. Yeah. 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 It's just, yeah, amazing to feel how variable it is. And it just reminded me, it was such a joy to read everybody's statements. You know, I mean, it's just a I was telling me, hey, I think she should use that material for writing because I think that's good for the kind of union and archetype. What is she writing? She wants to write her, um, she wants to write a paper like a I guess it's so now change people if you didn't already. Yeah, we were invited to the International Advisory Office Conference in Utah last year to present our paper. Um, and none of us know anything. And so we want to write another paper so that we can go and present there. So we were really excited to have us. We're still like seven. It was a conference except for our paper. But, you know, she wants to make it. When we wrote this first paper, it was so much. Beautiful union, especially um, framing. And they come up and they make the one of the mechanistic science. So bring the union framing and then use the data of like, the architects that come up. It was all the details. It really was. It was really her orientation. And Jennifer, there was a bunch of other data writers on the call. And she really, uh, she's a really solid researcher. Who said I mean, at uh, San Francisco State? Yeah, and so she helped me and I'll help Kate. So, yeah, it would be so much data. Yeah, I mean, like, just to make sure. But yeah, I think it would be good to have one that's really looking at just amazing how freely you can share it. And the, the, the precise creativity of the ensemble, which is in terms of what the demon looks like and also what the ally looks like. Yeah, it's what the demon says, and what the artist says. It's really And what the demon is ever the same. It's beautiful. Six. Seven. Okay, so now we could have a few minutes for questions or comments uh, of your experience. Um, if if any uh, any questions came up in terms of the process or how to use this or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, do you work with the same issue um, or feeling consecutively or just consistently? Like, do you find that people's experiences that the demon changes or the outline changes? Or the yeah, changes? I'll repeat the question for the people online. Um, the question was, if you work with the same demon over time, does it change and does the ally change? Is that like the same? feeling or this the same fear yeah or... right yeah 
So if you're working with, let's say you have a core demon that just is always repeating, uh, then always do it like you're doing it for the first time. Don't think, oh, I know where this is in my body. I know what color it is. I know what it looks like. And the same with the ally. There can be a tendency, especially with allies, to jump to some old ally that you already had. And so you, you have to really stay with your current sensations in both cases. So that allows the demon to evolve. Because as you work with it over time, it will evolve, it will change. And if you always keep it looking the same and, and the ally as well, then it, you, you don't give it an opportunity to change and evolve. Mm -hmm. But it's a good idea to repeat with the same ally because, I mean, the same uh, demon, because we have core issues usually, and they're usually not resolved in one demon feeding, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> it would be great if they were. Uh, although it does happen, especially with kids. Uh, I've had several experiences experiences with doing feeding your demons with kids and heard about this also well they'll, they'll have like a like a, let's say a pathological fear of spiders and one demon feeding mm -hmm. after years of all kinds of therapy is gone and they've got their ally uh, and that does happen with adults as well but generally those things that are more kind of impacted in us need more time to work with it. Yeah. I was wondering if you could uh, share some insight on grief. I feel like my demon was associated with grief, but it like would morph as like other emotions that kind of fit under that grief uh -huh. umbrella would arise. Mm -hmm. And so it was hard for me to keep it. It was morphing. Yeah. It yeah. was like, how am I now shifting to how it's changed or yeah. trying to just stick with right. it? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll repeat the question again. Um, she was working with grief and, and it, it, it started morphing uh, while she was doing it into different kinds of emotions. And she, she's wondering what, what do you do if that happens? Yeah. So um, this can happen also, when you're doing the demon feeding, like when you look at it and you start seeing it and then suddenly it starts changing, looking different. What I suggest you do then is stick with the first one, whatever it is, and then finish the whole process with that. And then you can always go back if if some other, you know, oh, actually, this isn't grief. It's whatever anger or um whatever then you can go back to the anger and and then do the whole process again with that at, at some other time or or even right afterwards so you kind of say okay i'll get to you you know <laughs> don't worry because if we haven't been feeding our demons there's usually a line <laughs> they're like oh. You haven't been paying attention to me. You've been trying to get rid of me. And so it's not just one there. And it's one of like those Russian dolls, you know, where you, you deal with one and then under it's another one. And I think that's what you were talking about. So, yeah, just do one and then you can do the other ones. Yeah. Thank you, Mom. So we have a... Sorry? Um, um, okay. I'll, I'll call her on her and then if there's somebody else I'll do the next person uh, so when the demon says what they need uh, that's the moment that I realized uh, let's say if they need um, something emotional a uh, feeling of security emotional to keep mm -hmm. it, or verification or attention mm -hmm. that's when um, I realized the emptiness behind that construct mm -hmm. and so something breaks down and so uh, I feel the, that liberation. You feel what? Um, so something breaks down. That I, yeah. That this is the construct and I don't need it. Right. Yeah. But then when it's something physical, meaning let's say it's about a pleasure or let's say they need a touch or they need 
some people, like, when they're hungry, like, they, they need food, so it's yeah. difficult. Then it becomes difficult to understand uh, the emptiness behind it. And yeah. it's more uh, crucial, or it's a more real need, uh -huh. rather than that emotional security or very difficult okay. to the construct. So, so I'm going to repeat it, see if I got it, what you're trying to ask. That when uh, when she uh, got to the need of um, what was the example you used? So the emotional like needing verification. Yeah, verification or security. Then she could realize that was empty. But when it was a more concrete need like hunger or touch, then uh, realizing that 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 was a a construct. Um, was more difficult. Yeah. So what I would say is um, the point is not to realize it's empty. It's to deal with that actual need of, of let's say, safe attachment or security or whatever. So um you're allowing that you're it's it's okay to need that and one of the interesting things that happened to me this year is i i did this with ann siegel who uh has written a lot about attachment theory and uh he's he said this is so brilliant. This method of feeding your demons is so brilliant because that need question gets to the underlying attachment need that's very early, like soothing, safety, security. I, he's, he, he always has those, you know, all these S's or he, he, he does a lot of those kind of things. But anyway, so, so these, these fundamental needs are often what the need question reveals. And so he said, what's interesting is that the uh, the want is the thing that the ego constructs to try to deal with the need not being met. Like our addictions are often what we construct because we didn't get that fundamental love and security. And so then we we develop these strategies to deal with that and that's what the want is and we actually were writing an article about that yeah but anyway so so uh seeing it as empty that's another kind of practice and here we're we're really listening to that need and that's okay that's what that's okay and then how you feel if you get that then that could be very healing to that deep need that maybe you've had since childhood that's you've never you've never taken care of yourself in that sense to try to offer yourself that that deep need that you have at a very fundamental level so this can be very deeply healing F feeding your demons can be very deeply he healing because of that you're welcome yeah you can just say it and then I'll say it back. Uh, I'm so curious about how to work with a uh, demon that's on the individual, like personal level versus sort of collective or societal. Mm. And for example, something that kind of came up for me was how the feminine has been suppressed. And then what would we need to a guidance mm -hmm. on that bigger? The collective level, yeah. So her question is, what if the demon that comes up for you is also a collective demon, like repression of women, for example? How do you deal with that collective demon if you're if you're doing a personal demon work? So what I suggest is you do it as a personal demon. In other words, also, when we do work with collective demons, and there is a way to do that in a group or, you know, in a business or in whatever, um, then we still always work with the individual's experience of that because it's different for everybody. Like that, that experience, say, of the oppression of women, your experience is your experience and it's different than anybody else's. 
And if you deal with it on that real personal level, then it can be personally healing as well as working with the more general problem. Yeah. So maybe we take the one online and uh -huh. probably wrap up in a moment. Okay. Uh, how do we deal with one online? Can you unmute? Yeah, there we go. Oops. Her hand went down. Are you, do you still have the question? Okay. No, I just was going to can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, I was going to say something that a person before me kind of just said. Um, today was amazing. I have been carrying on this enactment of the orphan abandoned person, and I'm in my 60s. Um, mm. I was going to say, I mean, not constantly. I was going to say anecdotally that I did this with you at Spirit Rock Sultrum, and I've been around the Vipassana world for decades. What I saw, women shaking and all this stuff, this is powerful. I'm not going to compare, mm -hmm. but um, so I did my own fumbling version, not based on should, but of this kind of methodology for my work around sexism and racism for a long time. And I am mm -hmm. going to take this with me and officially write about it and call it that, if that is okay with you guys. Uh, credit everybody. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, it might be good to talk maybe uh, to, uh, you know, in another context to find yeah. out exactly what you've been doing and, uh, you know, how it is like feeding your demons and how it isn't exactly. I'm talking um, about white people's work most around the demons, but. Um, white people. Yeah, maybe collective healing work. Sounds yeah, like. yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm really interested in what you've been doing. Okay. And so if you can write to info at paramandala.org <laughs> and then that will that that will get to me. And then um we can communicate. Okay. One of the things I should say before we end is that we do have a training for people who want to become certified in this work and actually use it uh, for as therapists or facilitators or even just in their own lives in various ways. Um, and uh, you can also write to the same email info at paramandala.org and ask when the next one will start it's now possible to get completely certified online. So you can do the whole process without being in person, but we wanna have more in-person trainings now that we can. But because like many places, we had to pivot and figure out how we were gonna keep reaching people and helping them during COVID, we did develop this online program and uh, so that's possible. But I was actually just talking today to Lopan Chandra about uh, possibly doing at the Olympic in uh, Berkeley a, uh, a, a process of a couple of training level one, uh, which is the, the ground of feeding your demons, where I teach also Prajnaparamita, which is a nature of mind practice, so that you have the Buddhist practice and the feeding your demons practice, and possibly in two weekends or, or uh, once a week for a certain number of weeks or something like that. So we just uh, talked about that today, and I, I think that we'll, we'll do that in the Bay Area. But I imagine that a lot of you online are not in the Bay Area. So, um, so the, the online option uh, is still possible. I believe the next one's starting in September. There's one going on now. So that's something to keep in mind uh, to be certified. And now we're beginning to train people to teach groups. Uh, that, that first training is going on right now to... Up until now, we've only certified people to work with clients, but now um, we're uh, training people to actually teach it. And so those first ones will be authorized um, in June, I believe. Yeah. So that's that's an, another possible thing that you can develop.
in the future if you're if you love this and you think it's fantastic <laughs> and you want to do it and you want to share it and mm. you can yeah well i just wanted to share another resource that i have just found so such a blessing that on youtube both Rafa and chandra and uh on social we this practice yeah so you can just, yeah 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 you can find it at home yes you can uh, find it on uh yeah on youtube and chandra does teach it here once a month so um i have so many new faces here so i imagine who here is their first time at the dharma collective university yeah. Oh, wow. So really That's wonderful good. to see all you wonderful new faces. Um, we have teachings many nights of the week. We have one of our beloved teachers, Tig O'Malley, in the back and myself. Um, Tig's teaching a beautiful course on um, embodied ethics this week. I am um, teaching the Thich Nhat Hanh's book of Old Path, White Clouds, The Historical Life of the Buddha. We're 25 chapters in, about 26 more to go. <laughs> and if you're interested in joining us and being part of this community, we would love that. It's just so great to have you all here. And we're so fortunate um, to have Lama with us. And yeah, really, yeah. yeah, wonderful to be here. Hope we have much more energy around how we can bring these practices to more people and um, create these opportunities for connection. Being in person is just such a joy. So yeah, Thank I'm not just so randomly much. scanning. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm looking. I have a QR code. It's very impressive. In my phone. <laughs> very modern. Yeah. And um, if you come with your phone, you can get this. Yeah. And then uh, that'll take you to the connection yeah. where you can find out more about feeding your demon. <laughs> <And I, laughs> can you email us up here if anyone wants to get on the tower model? Like, no. Oh, great. Oh, um, great. And then there's cookies that need yeah. and I and I really want to thank the Sarasco Dharma Collective. It's so amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Who's here from the Dharma Collective? That, yeah. So maybe look at those people because you can connect with them to find out yeah. more about what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Lots of love. And it was a pleasure to be with you.